Hello, everybody. I'm Jesse Waters, along with Kimberly Guilfoyle, Geraldo Rivera, Dana Perino, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. The book that shook Washington and ended the relationship between President Trump and Steve Bannon hit stores at midnight, despite cease and desist orders to keep it from publication. This morning, author Michael Wolff was very appreciative of all the free promotion from the president and his lawyers. What I say is, uh, is wait, where do I send the box of chocolates? You think he's helping you sell books? I, I, absolutely. I mean, and not only is he helping me sell books, but he's helping me prove the point of the book. <laughs> the White House calls Fire and Fury a work of fiction. Mr. Trump says he authorized zero White House access to Wolf and never spoke to him for his, quote, phony book. <laughs> it's full of lies, misrepresentations, and sources that don't exist. Look at this guy's past and watch what happens to him and Sloppy Steve. Back to that new nickname in a moment. But first, Wolf challenges the president's interview denial. I absolutely spoke to the president. Whether he realized it was an interview or not, um, I, I don't know. But it certainly was not off the record. I did, and you spoke to him at the White House after he was sworn in. Uh, I spoke to him after the inauguration, yes. And I had spoken to, I mean, I've spent about... Uh, three hours with the president over the course of the campaign in, in the White House. So my window into Donald Trump is, um, um, is pretty significant. Why don't we see if Sarah Sanders can settle it? We said they spoke once by the phone for a few minutes, but it wasn't about the book. They had a very short conversation, but he never interviewed the president about the book. He repeatedly begged to speak with the president and was denied access. And he makes it sound uh, like he was sitting outside the Oval Office every single day, which is just not the case. Uh, this is a guy who made up a lot of stories to try to sell books. Uh, and I think more and more people are starting to see uh, that his facts just simply don't add up. Okay, Kimberly, before we get your take on the recent developments, I'd like to ask you about the new nickname. Mm. And where do you think Sloppy Steve ranks in the hierarchy of Trump nicknames? I don't think it's as good as, like, Pocahontas <laughs> or Lion Ted. It's, good. it's um, good, though. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Because it conjures up the image of, like, a Sloppy Joe. You know, like this <laughs> big, messy sandwich or, like, something. that I don't know. It, it's not something, right, right, doesn't it? But it's not something I'd be happy with if no. I was Steve Bannon because no. it just suggests sort of a slovenly, disheveled appearance. So it's, it's not, um, shall we say, a charming, um, no. affectionate nickname. Not the best one. And, and Geraldo, you were kind of mumbling to yourself when we were listening to the soundbite about the access that this guy got and kind of ridiculing the fact that he only got three hours in the course of, what, nine months? It's, it's more than nine months because the campaign began in 2015. So what you have is three hours. But that is not three hours of Michael Wolff speaking with President Trump or President-elect Trump or candidate Trump. That's him being in the presence of, uh, of Donald Trump, the man that he absolutely analyzes as if he were a shrink and says things. I have to say that yesterday my wrath was directed at the Benedict Arnold, Steve Bannon, who absolutely has b behaved traitorously uh, to the family that entrusted him. Today I really, and I don't generally like criticizing reporters, but Michael Wolff said something that I think begs exploration and analysis. Michael Wolf said, and I'm quoting, 100% of the people around Donald Trump, senior advisors, family members, every single one of them questions his intelligence and fitness for office. Really? That's a every thing. single one of the family members of Donald This is a patent lie. This is absolutely untrue. And at some point, even people on the left, have to admit, as the Washington Post did today when they questioned uh, that whether he got access at all under false pretenses. Everyone watching has to question every single one of the president's uh, family. So Ivanka, who Michael Wolf said was dumb as rocks, she questions the, Ivanka questions the intelligence and fitness of her father for office. This is not true. And it is unfair. It is, it is so screamingly uh, inequitable to uh, accuse 
uh, the president of being someone who lacks intelligence and fitness for office and then say every one of his own family agrees with me, the author. I think that this is Well, you know for a disgusting. fact that they don't think that. Absolutely, Not, I know They that. love their Everybody father. Everybody knows right. that. It's it is logical. You know that it is untrue. It's riddled with a lot of dishonest reporting, and we've pointed to some of those examples, but they did let the fox into the hen house, Dana, yeah. for a long time, so they do share a little responsibility for this salacious report. Yeah, I mean, it's, one of the things that he said this morning was that he kept waiting for someone to say, why are you in this meeting? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just inconceivable to me that this it, actually happened in the first place. Isn't that true? But remember, at the very beginning, they didn't have a White House communications director. It was unclear who was responsible for what. And Sean Spicer's role was not only press secretary, but also communications director. It's impossible, in my well. opinion, to do both and to do both well if you don't have people there that are looking out for you. And I, I, they really did a disservice to the president, like whoever, whoever decided to let him in. And then no one was able to say, wait, I don't think we should have him here. Maybe they, maybe they didn't even know, or maybe they thought that it was just part of the show. Um, that said, I think that he wouldn't have access to the, the West Wing if he wasn't granted it. You can't get right. in there. It's like you can't just like walk up and yeah, ring the doorbell on the list, right. and get in. Saunter in. But can't so. Steve Bannon grant him that kind sure. of carte blanche? Can't Steve Bannon by hanging with him? Hey, buddy, what's up? Sure. Uh, here's another thing uh, I don't believe buddy, either. Me and me and Mike, you know, here we are hanging out together. Well, I think they thought I it thought might be <laughs> positive. One of the things that Michael Wolff did um, leading up to the election was to write a couple of pieces that were very flattering about President Trump, and saying how intelligent he, how intelligent he was and how right. he was going to be able to pinpoint what the American people wanted and how he was able to win. And so that was one of the ways that he got his foot in the door. Yep. And, and, and again, I don't, I don't blame him. And then he writes this book. And I, I've heard a couple of things also that are like factually wrong. Like one thing about Mitch McConnell, uh, there's a report in there that he declined to take a meeting because he needed to get a haircut. And his office says, that's ridiculous. That never happened. The one thing I think that is a little bit of a danger is that um, he says, he says, and I don't know if he'll reveal any, but he has notes and recordings and contemporaneous reports. And so if you were one of those people that thought you were talking to him off the record and you get burned in this book, you might be really cautious about saying it never happened because mm -hmm. then you'll be super more embarrassed. It's better to just let it go and try to move on. So how damaging is it, Greg? Um, I don't know. When he said uh, he was in Trump's presence for three hours, I think he was talking about three reruns of The Apprentice. <laughs> he was watching in his hotel room. What a prefer... I, I, this is a preferable problem to have. Let's compare two, two situations. Hillary has a book out telling everyone why she lost. Wolf's book is telling you what happened after Trump won. Mm. Which book, if you were Donald Trump, would you prefer <laughs> to have? Okay? Point, so, right? so, I mean, I, th I think I would take the victory book. Who right. cares? <laughs> and, and, and by the way, Democrats, you're laughing at this stuff? You're laughing at all this stuff that you're reading about, about him being impetuous, impulsive, a child? How does it feel to be beaten by somebody <laughs> like that exactly. who had less knowledge, less knowledge in the specialty of the expertise of your candidate. Your politician got beaten by a non-politician Queens salesman. Salesman from <laughs> Queens beat. That's hilarious. Okay, that, and I want to go to the- in I your face. I want to go through the, the, also just the epiphany, the big juicy gossip here, because yeah. I think Jesse and Geraldo and I will understand this. The big juicy gossip here is that Trump is like a child. We are all that. Man. Every man has been told by their wife or Geraldo wives, that we are children. I know. That, that. No, 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 no. Men are children. If he had men generally who are, uh, are uh, who want things a certain way, yeah. who are impatient, you know, who don't have time to even read. In fact, just tell me what I need to know. We act like children. I'm reminded of this every day. In fact, that's a compliment because I'm mean more. Like babies, I mean, don't like you, you. Yeah, you would say you would say about me. You would say something worse. Like I'm the child from the Omen. Or the exorcist. So I think it's it, anybody who's just anybody who's a supervisor who's ever been a boss, they know everybody beneath you says crap about you because they're supposed to. It's a release. It's, and when there is a changeover, when there is a change, when a, when a team in a preseason is undergoing a change in personnel because they lost and now they're getting new people in, there's all those, there's half of those people that are just grousy. They're just saying, I hate, they're the guys that go. They always end up going, and, and then the other people stay. Chaos, there's chaos in a change of personnel. This is all normal. And all he did, he got in there and got to watch it. 
And he and that was the mistake. But that's a problem that's the to mistake. begin with that we said yesterday yeah. is why was he allowed sort of this unfettered access to like walk around, fly on the wall, listen in, overhear yep. conversations. That's I mean, it's really to me unbelievable that nobody actually said, hey, buddy. Take a hike. I, I do mean, like that, Dr. Evil's glasses, though. That's your nickname for Wolf. The yeah, Dr. Evil. Dr. Dr. Evil. Well, I think that you, like, one of the things is, what have we all learned this week? Never cooperate with a book, especially if you're in the middle of an administration, <laughs> if you actually have something going on. It will never turn out well. Or how about a, just ever? Years ago, I remember, I, when I was deputy press secretary one time, I, I was Carl Rove's spokesperson, mm -hmm. amongst other things, but he was one of my um, responsibilities. And a reporter, well-known, from a very liberal magazine came and they said, you know, I think Carl gets a bum rap. And I'd like to do a profile piece that talks about, like, you know, Carl's great, and right, Carl's right. super smart. And, so well, I was charmed, right? I went to the White House communications director. I said, I'd like to give him a shot. And Dan Bartlett said, knock yourself out. And I pulled out all the stops. Interviews, third party oh. backup, oh. Uh, brunch. Oh, I, I did everything. This piece ran. It was the meanest thing I have ever read in my life. And I, it was my fault. Did and you ever speak I, so to I him after? Have I, I've never spoken to him after. <laughs> All right, He's so, in the deep freeze. So what these guys do... <laughs> Not Carl. Permanent freeze. So yeah. they seduce you, and they tell you everything you want to hear, and then they get in, and yep. then it's a hatchet job. Yep. But See, I, I just want to say one thing about, uh, about what Dana mentioned about recordings and so forth. I, I my, in my opinion, during the time he's in the White House, I don't think he can have a recorder on him particularly. I think that that is... You record very, it on your phone. But you, I know you can do it, but I, I, don't, I think this guy's much more of a schmoozy no, kind of... I don't of, think... No, like, if you're yeah, in the White House out, and a reporter comes in... And then he in remembers and, then, and recreates what I think he, he I think you're right. Yeah, He's that guy who hangs out at accuracy. Michael's, the restaurant, right. with I other... I was just there today. Yeah, with... The, with and of he's course out, you and, are. And he's the worst kind of friend. Definitely. Don't tell him anything. Yeah, he's not a friend. Yeah, I also I don't believe this report that just came out <laughs> this afternoon. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure that they are hearing this, but I don't believe that it's true. What? Axios put out a report that said oh, that yeah. Steve Bannon was thinking about putting out a statement that disavowed the book and his quotes, but the president's statement beat him to it, and therefore he didn't do it. That's actually I true. don't believe that. I don't believe that he was going to do that because there were hours and hours yeah. that lapsed between that book coming out and the president's statement. And if you want to get it in front of it, and not cause a problem. Well, he obviously delayed and didn't do it, but that's one right. of the things that was said, that he was working on it, then they started issuing the statement and said, forget well, it. Why, but I think, why not do Kirk? it right away? Why did well, call that's the, the best he could do the next day, because if there are tapes, he cannot say or disavow right. that he didn't do it or he didn't say it, he didn't make all of these comments. He knows himself if he said it, right? And if in any way, shape, or form, this guy has it on a recording, yep. he's screwed. Yeah. So the best thing you can say is the president is a great man the next day. I, I think could, Bannon is screwed regardless. Could, speaking of, could you imagine if a reporter like Michael Wolff was inside the Clinton White House sure. in the 90s? I mean, could you imagine, would a reporter watching the girls go in and go out and what was going on in the Oval Office, what kind of book? This is nothing. Those are the tapes that we definitely <laughs> want to hear. Wait, yeah. what was that book that just came out about the Hillary Clinton campaign? Uh, the Politico book. Remember the two, uh, the two authors? Uh, and Shattered. The, mm -hmm. Shattered. Yeah. And, the, and the Clinton campaign was furious. Yeah, like, yeah. how dare Because it talked about all of them speaking badly about each other, about the candidate, mm -hmm. and like it's, uh, these things happen and you can get through it. Right, well, the, he's, the president's given it so much attention, the book's now <laughs> going to be a number one bestseller. He regrets that. For I... better or for worse. All right, the new year just got even worse for Hillary, though. Stay tuned. <laughs> Yesterday, we told you the Justice Department may have launched a new investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. Today, we confirmed it's also launched a probe into whether her family's foundation exchanged any political favors for donations while she was Secretary of State. The pay-to-play probe means three possible investigations are now underway involving Hillary. Uranium One is the third. The White House has, is pleased that the DOJ and FBI are taking this on. I think it's a great thing that, that it's being looked at, uh, and we'll have to wait and see what happens, but there's certainly been a lot of information out there that I think gives all of us cause for concern, and I think it's important that they're finally taking a look at it, and, and we'll, see, we'll see what comes from it. 
In a statement, the Clinton Foundation says, time after time it's been subjected to politically motivated allegations, and time after time these allegations have been proven false. None of this has made us waver in our mission to help people. All right, Jesse, so get your take on the three investigations and then the communications uh, response from the Clinton team. The foundation has done good work, but it's shady. Everybody knows it's shady. The allegation is a racketeering charge, it looks like, where you exploit and monetize your power as Secretary of State in order to enrich yourself, enrich your friends, uh, skirt fundraising laws, campaign finance laws. And there are FBI agents now on the ground in Little Rock, Arkansas, where the foundation was founded, asking a lot of tough but fair questions. And I rightfully believe that hidden people are very worried about this, very worried about it, because everybody knew what was going on when she did this. She concealed a lot of the donations mm -hmm. that she got as Secretary of State. She was supposed to uh, tell the Obama administration who was donating, how much they were donating. She's had to go back and refile years and years of taxes. Very she sloppy. hid $20 million in donations. She was supposed to report. She didn't. So there's obviously something fishy there. But to be fair, I do still think this is politics. This is the president or his Justice Department leaning on the Clintons because he's being unfairly hit on the Russia collusion garbage. I just, I don't want to see Hillary locked up. Uh, I don't know, a lot of people probably don't agree, but it just seems like they're criminalizing politics. Obviously, it was pay to play, but you know what? That's politics. Well, that doesn't make it legal. Doesn't make it legal, but you know, I'm just so sick of everybody <laughs> threatening to go to jail. Okay. All right. So, Dana, what do you make of it? Because, you know, there's criticism saying, like Jesse says, that this is, uh, you know, politics, that this is, you know, you punch me, I punch you back yeah. twice as hard. Well, um, I was skeptical of it for the similar reasons, but John Yu, uh, the former DOJ official, yes. and he's now at uh, UC Berkeley, he was on the Daily Briefing show today, and I asked him about, the, oh is that a concern? And he said that he thinks that the, uh, the Clinton Foundation one in particular is on the merits. Yes. Uh, I think the uranium one thing is not. But So I, th I took his word for that, that if they find something, they should go ahead and, and, and follow it up. But if I were at the White House, I would not say, I think this is a good thing. Because yeah. that's the allegation, is that you're trying sure. to push it. Instead, just say, you'll have to ask the Justice Department. They're the ones looking into it. Like, we have no involvement. Because every time they talk about it, it looks like they are pushing the Justice Department to do something in order to save Jeff Sessions. Right. And, and Greg, so if there's criminality uh, here at play, you've got to investigate it. You've got to take it through to its fruition. You can't just say, OK, well, maybe it's just let it go. We don't want to lock her up because she's a woman or because of her age. I don't abide by that, okay? <laughs> I got no problem. <laughs> but the point is, follow the law, up. follow the law and the facts and do a, a, a full and thorough um, investigation. And if need be, then you proceed forward. Career of Jeff, Jeff Sessions or not? Well, I mean, it, it, the Clintons, we know, they're shadier than Michael Moore's shadow. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's big. You get it? Got it. Got anyway. It. I was trying um, to figure that out. With the, you're talking about a beard? What no, were I, you know? Here's the, the oh, thing. God. Everything you say is correct. Uh, but the, you, let's compare the stories, the A to B, the A block to B block. Trump isn't about corruption. It's about chaos, right? Hillary isn't about chaos. It's about corruption. What story is more important? Obviously, corruption. What sto story is more fun? Chaos. So the Trump, the, the Clinton scandal, that's the vegetables. And the Trump story is the ice cream sundae. Mm. And everybody loves an ice cream sundae, and they all hate vegetables. And I'm, I'm with, it, everything you say is true, but I'm kind of with Jesse and with what, what uh, Geraldo said yesterday. Stick it's with like, me, Greg. Okay, you know but it's, it's, it's hard to start eating vegetables when you had so much ice cream. <laughs> I'm full of scandal. No, yeah, I'm I, I, out. Depends I, what you dip them in. Well, if you dip the vegetables in the ice cream, yeah. Dobbs does that in the green That's room. That's gross. That's <laughs> gross. I, I think going over <laughs> Hillary <laughs> Clinton's <laughs> emails like calling up your prom date from high school. It is so over. <laughs> Uranium one is oh, so Oh, they bogus. don't think so. Is, believe they, me. These, these two are not scared. I think that they, you know, maybe with the Clinton Foundation, because it is so big. I went to one of their... Uh, uh, conventions here at the Hilton. Yeah. It was the most lavish thing I'd ever seen. They had yeah. rugs, specially Is it Michael's for lunch? Is it the Clinton <laughs> Foundation? No, 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 I, I, I have to Living say that there's, there's so much Langans. money being yeah, spent like by the foundation that does not, it seems to me, as a person who has run many, many charitable organizations, it seems lavish and there's probably, uh, there's never been subpoenas as far as I know in terms of the Clinton Foundation. And maybe that has some justification, but the email, please 
Forget about these emails already. Uranium what do you have in there, Geraldo? I know. What were you emailing? <laughs> well, now, because you That's eat it, Michaels, you go to the chair. There are emails no. with you. She bleached his. <laughs> Those are done. Bleach bit. Yes, we'll get it all I'll out of here. play for the other team. <laughs> so they say. Trump bashing is a favorite pastime of Hollywood elites, but the host of the Golden Globes proclaims he won't be mocking the president on Sunday. Do you believe Seth Meyers? Next. Trump claims he invented the phrase tax cuts. That is so fake. The only thing that would be more fake is claiming you came up with the word fake. <laughs> President Trump reportedly joked to House Republicans today that he only likes between 30 to 40 percent of them. Don't worry, he says that all the time, said his kids. <laughs> Former President Obama will meet with the leaders of China and India during an upcoming trip abroad, while President Trump will, will meet with who he thinks are the leaders of China and India. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, but so mean, really, so coarse, so cruel. It's late night, talk host Seth Meyers, of course, and he doesn't miss a chance to tear into President Trump on his show. So you would expect that he would let it rip when he hosts the Golden Globe Awards this weekend. But even though he will be performing in front of a crowd of celebrities, most of whom are passionately anti Trump, the comedian is indicating that he will be skipping the political jokes on Sunday. That's at least what he told The Hollywood Reporter. I am reserving the right to change my mind, he said. But especially this year, with everything that's happened in Hollywood, it seems far more important to have the focus there as opposed to anything that is happening in Washington, D.C. You know, Greg, I was in the audience in 2011. The You're White everywhere. I know. The White House oh, they're, they're they're come on. All right, all right. You have a video but the, the reason it is relevant is Seth Meyers was the host. President Obama mm -hmm. and Seth Meyers together they attacked President Trump or, or uh, a businessman Donald Trump in the audience in a way that was so absolutely vicious. I'm convinced that's where Donald Trump made up his mind to run for the White House. That 2011. That he's going to take you, it. Do you yeah. believe that that Thanks, Hollywood generally or the uh, Seth Meyers specifically can refrain from attacking Donald Trump? You know. He almost has no choice because, you know, Hollywood is now the sanctuary city for sexual assault. They, and they, therefore, they've abdicated their moral standing in the world. No longer can Hollywood tell us what to eat, what to drive, how to talk, because they are a city of scum. Uh, and half the audience knew what was going on. By the way, they should have they should have picked a woman to host the Golden Globes. He's close. Oh. No, he's a beta male. He's a beta oh, male who, who speaks from the back of his throat, and he's safer than the gold in Fort Knox. He's not going to offend anybody there. He's going to go out there. He's going to say some solemn words, and everybody in the audience, they're all going to nod along, and they're going, you know, we really learned. This is a really a learning moment for all, a teachable moment for all of us in Hollywood, and we're all going to change. But they they all knew. They all knew. Teachable moment. Is that a banned phrase? I, I banned I it a while ago. But, but he know. hasn't rebanded in 2018. Yes. I, oh, I have to go and reband everything. But interesting <laughs> that you know beta males so well. <laughs> well, I've been around a few. <laughs> <laughs> You've married a couple. Oh! 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 It's hot here. Finally, you got me. Finally. <laughs> You've got black on. The women will be wearing black. Yes. Or, you know, yes. To make a political statement. He was I a say, Democrat, <laughs> Kimberly. Do you do you think that? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Oscar So White, remember that just a couple of years ago yes. where they were, were complaining about the fact that uh, people, actors of color, weren't yeah. getting enough roles or enough, uh, you know, uh, nominations and so forth. Uh, does politics uh, take away the entertainment value or is it an important platform to make a point? Um, look, I mean, I think it's uh, you should be respectful of the office of the presidency, but people don't seem to be, like, across the board as it relates to the presidency of uh, Donald Trump. They weren't as it relates to the candidacy of Donald Trump at the time. But, look, they're going to make their jokes. You have to have take things in stride. He has had a particularly good attitude given the fact that he is constantly made fun of or belittled, et cetera. So Donald it, Trump. Donald Trump, yes, absolutely. But in some of these award shows, it comes back to bite them if they go too over the top, I've noticed, and people in different charity events. They've had comedians go forward that have tried to make personal attacks against the president, and it didn't work. And I've seen that happen. Like, George Lopez did it. It backfired mm. on him. So you have to be very careful kind of the, how you handle it and how it comes across. And yet that audience, Dana, is so obviously liberal, progressive, anti-Trump. It is almost inevitable, isn't it? I mean, well, can they I keep it funny? I think what it's going to be is that it will be a sly situation, mm. okay, because he knows his audience. So mm -hmm. he won't actually say the joke. It'll be some sort of joke or jokes with double meeting, 
and then it will be followed by a pause that goes on for a beat too long until everybody gets it and they all start laughing, but no one will be able to say that he actually made a joke about Donald Trump. You, can it be a funny kind of atmosphere? I mean, is, they had drinking games in the past. I mean, Ricky Gervais is so funny. They got drunk as the show progressed. That sounds I mean, good. yeah, I'm going to be drunk if I watch it because it's not going to be very good. So you can't make fun of Trump. You can't make Harvey Weinstein jokes, obviously. PC culture is now crazy. You can't make any sort of racy joke at all. They have nothing left to say. So that's why I'm looking forward to the real award show on Monday, the <laughs> fake news award <laughs> yes. hosted yes. by Donald Trump at 5 p.m. Tune in. Ratings bonanza. That's right. Wait, wait, I, here. Well, I would just want to clarify. When you said that Hollywood was scum, do you mean that? Not they, everybody. I mean, I. I but I, do you mean for what for what they are covering up or what? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I probably should or? I probably should pull that back a little bit because there are a lot of fine people there that. You know, aren't Harvey Weinstein, but there are a lot of people that knew about. It. You know, I have this fantasy that Harvey Weinstein is driving back from JFK, and his dry, his car breaks down, and he's it's, he's in Queens, and he goes into an Italian restaurant to get some meatballs, and there's Paul Sorvino yeah. sitting at the table, and maybe he's with Joe Pesci, <laughs> and it's settled there forever. Put De Niro there too, might as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although who's to, I don't know what whose side De Niro's on. Why perfectionism Ooh. can be hazardous to your health. That's next. Welcome back. No one's perfect, but the struggle to get there is causing a lot of distress for youth in America, according to new research. Perfectionism is making many millennials and Generation Zers, like those younger than millennials, anxious, depressed, and sick, impacting their abilities to succeed in their careers more so than other generations. Why? Part of it is due to social media pressure they feel to measure up to their peers. Their study also pinpoints harsh economic conditions and the need to please demanding Parents, every year I write a column for millennials with some advice. You can check it out on foxnews.com. And I'm going to do a little Facebook Q&A tomorrow at 2 o'clock for anyone who needs more advice. But why wait for that when you can get it right here yes. from all of these fine people that are very successful. Jesse, you're the closest to a millennial. I'll let you give them advice. Thank you. I understand why the pursuit of perfection can be worrisome because when you're taking the selfies, yeah. it takes like a thousand takes to get a good one. I and noticed you perfected you, the angle to get your Yeah, the angle top, is, yeah. you know, high and wide. And then when you post it, everybody else on Instagram or anything looks perfect because they have all the little filters and, like, you know, they take hours to do it. So you just feel really depressed. So don't go on these social media websites day after day after day. That would be first piece of advice. But they go 100 times a day. Uh, they go way too much. Second piece of advice, don't just chase the job for the cash. Do what you like, and you'll end up liking what you do. It's cheesy, but it's true. And then when you do have the job, don't expect to be promoted within the first six months. Well, that was actually, Greg, in this you article, they said in. that um, after eight months, they start getting restless and itchy, and they feel like they're not contributing enough, and they're not appreciated enough, so then they want to quit. This story comes up every generation. Right. It, ha it happened in the 60s. It disaffected 70s. I think it skipped the 80s. Yeah, the 90s awesome. with the grunge movement, everybody was sad and wearing plaid. Uh, not plaid. What do you call it? Uh, yeah, they wear those plaid flannel. They wear flannel. What I call outdoor plaid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, outdoor oh plaid. God. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. I don't want to mix this with like, the clinical depression that actually exists. These are the, this is the expected unease when you are young, and it happens and, and there and it happens now even more because you have more time to think because you have more leisure time. People are marrying later, so you're kind of putting off a lot of stuff. Plus, you are match. You're matching yourself up against a lot of people out there and you're getting this mixed up idea that they're doing better than you are but they really aren't a lot of people who put stuff on social networks are doing it because they aren't doing well mm. it's a way for them to to tell themselves that look at me I'm doing okay when in fact it, it's it they're kind of sad. Life is better now than it's ever been yep. in the history of the world. You're living yep. longer. It's healthier. You have more opportunities. You can move wherever you want. If you don't like your city, yep. you can go somewhere else. That's the beauty. You can be in four hours. You could be in another country. You could change your name. You could change your sex. 
My God, you have everything <laughs> at your fingertips. What are you waiting for? I, I don't know. I'm waiting for both of us he's to jump in together. Beta. Beta. By the way, but he, he's the perfect choice for me, but, third husband. Yeah, yeah, but available. you know what's interesting? <laughs> Fatalism is contagious. It's like you don't want to indulge people feeling gloomy. I always think, like, how many, how many, like, how many suicides were caused by Romeo and Juliet? Do you ever wonder? Never no. thought about it. Never. Think about it. Geraldo, does this kind I've of thing drive you crazy? That, right. Teenage, uh, you know, with the two millennials, Not Dana, a and, uh, and a Gen Extra. Z, Z, and Z, a Z, Z, and Z. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I really do think that Jesse is right. I, I, I really <laughs> believe that social media uh, has really upped the ante quite a bit. It's, it's like the kids, uh, this one's wearing this, this one went this place on vacation. Uh, look how happy everybody always is. Uh, you know, how stylish, how, you know, I, do I measure up? I really worry, particularly about the 12 year old, about Seoul, that, you know, th it's not about that. I, I, I really think that parenting is more important now than ever and making the kids put the screens down. You gotta put that down. I mean, Sol knows when I come into the room, there's got to be a really good reason why she's doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, honey, why? What's it? What is? What is this list? The list of this and that, of that? Or like, who did, uh, why didn't they, like, if somebody's not following me? Like, Kimberly, you have a very healthy approach to social media. Thank you so you much. You do not care. She has um, somebody else do it. <laughs> no, here's the thing. I actually don't care because people yeah. are going to write stuff. They're going to say True. stuff. What are you going to do? I mean, I feel very happy. Confident, you secure of myself. Yeah, and that's it. So it, it's there. I participate. I have a, a lot of followers. I appreciate them following. There's going to be people who are incredibly nice and gracious, and there's going to be people that obviously have something wrong with themselves or not going well in their life, and they want to try to be mean spirited. I feel sorry for you. But what would you advise these young people? I would say that, you know, really develop your own interests and look for yourself, you know, from within for happiness and don't make it as, how many followers I have or, you know, how many friends or how many people are texting me back or because, you know, you're just going chasing it down a rabbit hole and it's not a good idea. It's not yeah. healthy psychologically. But we want them to follow us on Instagram. This is not that's, that's okay. Nice. But this is not about a generation. You, we're talk, this is a different story. We're talk, we're, we talk about how we're worried about artificial intelligence. We're embracing this. We're, we're embracing this into our lives. This we is are. changing. So the idea that it's just a pr problem with kids, we're yeah, all. So much so that guess what? Oh, I just said that. Guess one. what? <laughs> Facebook Friday is coming right up. <laughs> oh, that's great. Facebook Friday. Yeah. Mr. In the valley of the Jolly Green Giant. I'm going fishing today. If anything new happens, call me. Yeah, I know. Hey, Facebook Friday, the first one of the year. Let's begin, okay? I can hear you talking to me. All right, question from Kathy N. This is such a good question. Give your life the title of a blockbuster movie. Oh, I know Kimberly's. You no, know Kimberly's? Why? What is it? You give me mine then. Wonder Woman. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Then Geraldo's would be, Thank I wonder, you. where's the women? Geraldo. <laughs> <laughs> Look no Geraldo further. of Arabia. That's right. Oh, there you go. Interesting. <laughs> but you're Puerto Rican. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of time That makes no sense. Small detail. A small detail. <laughs> and Jewish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 10% Native American. Oh, wow. Well. Oh, you Poke did that to Ancestry.com? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. How much money did you get for that plug? All right, Jesse. <laughs> I was going to say Water's World, but that was actually the biggest box office bomb of all time. Mm -hmm. Well, the remake with you. Will be yes. Right. What about? I'm going to do Love Actually. Oh, I yay! Just that that upset him. Worst movie ever I made. love it. I want to lock you in a room and make you watch it. No, you don't want to do that. I would slit my wrists. I anyway, want to lock I you in a room. <laughs> <laughs> that, that actually persuaded you even more. I'm going to say, say Small Wonder. Oh, that's cute. Oh, tiny wonder. Oh, small wonder. What about downsizing? Oh. <laughs> Honey, I should Geraldo, the kids. <laughs> just beat the joke into the ground, my daughter. <laughs> Linda M., this is a really good question. Good one so far. What is the one major thing that you'd like to pursue once you retire? Pursue, Geraldo. What major thing would you... I, I want to take my boat from New York, up the Hudson River, the Erie Canal, the Thousand Islands, the St. Lawrence River, into the Great Lakes, and explore the great interior nice. of the United States. Wow. Interesting. He's thought about this. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I like to come on Geraldo's boat and <laughs> you feel welcome. up for the ride. You're welcome. <laughs> I'd like to house sit when he's gone. You got to get on there. He's like Not shirtless the like, uh, <laughs> like Johnny, Johnny Depp, right? <laughs>
<laughs> we'll go into those states, those 29 states. No, I, I, I know that Kimberly's never going to retire, but it's say, let's do say. Do you know that? I, I think it's really inconceivable. <laughs> I don't think it's because the battery power is forever. In the West World, or <laughs> it just yes, goes exactly. and it goes. Yes. Yes. I don't know. I mean, I don't even know what retirement would kind of like look like. Uh, the only What I think of when you say to me, what would I do when I retire? I'm thinking of what other job I would want. Mm. Me too, yeah, right? What would be? So, I want to. I really do want to go work, do some work in Africa. And, and ambassador to Tanzania, if it's still on the. That's nice. List. I would like it. Why See, I ask I, him for it. You know, it's when I retire, I. Well, I have to leave now. Zanzibar is beautiful. I want to do absolutely nothing Next charitable. Term. When I retire, we are the Grinch. I just kind want. Like no, I'm doing a, I know. I want. Similar. I want to see how Very long similar. I can lie in bed and eat the same sandwich until I die. <laughs> I want to be. And when they find me, I want to be surrounded by rappers. And they go, "Where is he? Where? Is, didn't that so guy used to be on the five rappers? Sandwich, but, and, and and they have to get me. But out you like the salt the and cream. pepper pork All right. chops, <laughs> Jesse? Yes. Sorry, you didn't answer. No, he said he wants. No, to no, I'm, I'm sailing stuff. around the world with Geraldo. The producer told me you didn't answer. Oh, okay. No, they, said, apparently, the producers are watching show. another show. <laughs> she thought that was a fake news answer. She oh. always tunes me out of when I talk. Of course it's true. She's it's Water's right. World. He wants to go with Johnny Depp over here. Here, this is a funny question. I'll be okay. Gilligan. This is a thought experiment, if you will. More of a thought experiment than a question. Let's go. From Joan T. The year is 1880. No, it's not. It's 2018. Oh, I get it. You're 25 years old. What job would you have 25 when you're 18, and this is like, 80. And this is in, like re being realistic? Yeah. I probably would have had to be a school teacher. Mm, interesting. Oh. How sexist. Well, I'm just, you're, it's, it's realistic. Yeah, that's right? true. 1880. Geraldo, you were 14. No. <laughs> <laughs> no 1880 was the dawn of the Gilded Age. Uh, you know, there were a lot of, there's a lot of money here in uh, mm. Manhattan. I would have thought of some kind of business to service all those people with all that new cash. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Jesse? The only thing I was thinking of was I'm working on a railroad. <laughs> Wasn't that the dawn of, yeah, the, of was, the railroad yeah. industry in the United States? Yeah. Yeah. Your, your mom will tell you if that's a dumb answer. And it's not to mean as a school teacher is a bad thing, um, yeah. by the way. I think I would Everybody probably, says that. <laughs> I would probably not be in this country, and I would be some sort of royalty somewhere, don't you think? Oh, mm. You know what I'd be in 1880? Geraldo paints the picture. I'd be one of those sinister, drunken louts that hang out under a street lamp and smoke a cigarette. <laughs> good at that. Yes, so and, just sit there just, and then wait, and then try to, st and, and then wait until somebody leaves a bar, and then I shiv him. So, so, in Sacramento. Yes. So kind of like every Friday night in yes. Hell's Kitchen. But I'd right shiv him, and it'd be like gangs yeah, yeah, in New yeah. York, and I. I take their stuff. Yeah. And I have a little pocket of gold. Right. Just like a little leprechaun. Yeah. Perfect size. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. One more thing is up next. <laughs> and here is G.I. Joe with Kung Fu Grip. G.I. Joe has hands that grip. Fingers you hold open and let close. Okay, one more thing. I'll go first. We're debuting a new segment on Water's World this weekend. It's called Mugshot Mania. Here's a sneak peek. This guy is Noel Dawson. He was arrested in April 2017 for charging at his son with a hatchet. Now, Jimmy, if, if this guy came at you with a hatchet, I don't know what I'd be more scared of, the hatchet or his face. The face is the weapon, if That's we're being clear right. here. Oh, my God. That's right. But I was actually, when I, when I looked at this, he looks like what happens when you let a kid draw you. <laughs> All right, so that'll be this That's Saturday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. There you have it. Kimberly Guilfoyle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. So we're always looking for ways to improve ourselves. Um, some we? of us more than others, Greg. <laughs> but a great way after the holidays to be able to jumpstart your metabolism is a new book by my friend Dave Zanzenko. He has 20 New York Times bestsellers, mm. and it's fantastic. It's called the Super Metabolism Diet: The Two-Week Plan to Ignite Your Fat-Burning Furnace. All right, so that's what you can do. Furnace. I love this one in particular. It teaches you how you can lose weight while you're even sleeping. While I'm doing a Westworld robot power down. Well, you're, you're not eating when you're sleeping. Pounds. Good point. <laughs> That's how you lose weight. Greg's always thinking. They got to buy the book first. And how <laughs> eating certain foods can really help we'll jumpstart your metabolism to the point of someone who is half your age. So check it out. You will not be disappointed. He's got the abs diet book, the eat this, not that. You can see him on GMA. Oh, Name all good. the books, Kimberly. We only have three minutes left. <laughs> all right. Some people are so, so jealous. Tomorrow, Saturday, 10 p.m., I got 
Rob O'Neill, of course, the great Rob O'Neill. You know what he did. The great comedian Tom Cotter, Cat Timp, Tyrus, Saturday, January 6, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And it'll be repeated, but watch it anyway. It'll be awesome, and it's brand new. Time for this. Greg's commuter news. You know, there's a massive snowstorm going around. Uh, if you haven't noticed, the best way to get around, hire an Australian shepherd, <laughs> the dog. Check this out. <laughs> this uh, adorable uh, dog uh, uh, is a three-year-old uh, who uh, enjoys <laughs> sledding on his oh own. God. And uh, there see, we go. there you go. I think everybody's oh. seen this by now. I so Is that incredible? That's good. Uh, Whoa. Yeah. Oh, good form. Unbelievable. And, and he takes it all the way. Oh, my God. Yeah. Better, 20. better That's than a, us, except yeah. for Dana, I can't do champion that. Champion Mike Sledder. I cannot good. do that. All right, Dana. Go, all go. Right. Okay, uh, one Philadelphia father has figured out the best way to measure his child's growth a cheesesteak. Jesse, you could probably like this. Yeah, yeah Philly, Philly. Philly. So Brad Williams created the cheesecake for scale system to measure the progress of his infant son, Lucas. Started when he noticed the cheesecake he'd ordered for dinner was very similar Thanks. in size. And then we'd take a photo every month his first year, but apparently they had to stop because Lucas is not into the cheesesteaks anymore. Uh, Williams says babies are just like cheesesteak. Wrapped up, they are warm and cuddly, but once you unwrap them, Expect a huge mess. Yeah. Ooh, Ooh that's, that's what we and, do, and make sure you know which one you're eating. <laughs> okay, Geraldo. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to not do the one more thing that I was going to do because Ooh. we have a Fox News alert. Seriously, uh, there has been the first criminal referral, I'm not joking, first criminal referral from the Senate, from uh, Senators Grassley and Graham. And guess who has been referred uh, to the Department of Justice by the Senate Judiciary Committee? Christopher Steele, the author of the dossier, the infamous dossier, is the first criminal referral. They have reason to believe, says Senators Grassley and Graham, that Christopher Steele lied to the feds. Ooh. So this is a major, major development. So, you know, here, how ironic, with all of the Russia gate, who's the first criminal referral? From the Senate to the Department Geraldo, of Justice. I like your one more things. Good stuff. <laughs> All right, that's it for us tonight. Be sure to come back and see us on Monday. Have a great weekend.